All right, so here we're going to talk about malignancies of the breast. And uh, I talked about some of the benign masses, or uh, you could say semi-benign masses, of the breast uh, in uh, the other section. Um, I also talked about uh, more of the anatomy and definitely the physical examination of the breast, which is extremely important both to educate your patients on how to do a self-breast exam uh, as well as how to do a clinical breast examination uh, in detecting both the benign masses of the breast, but even more importantly, these malignant masses of the breast, which because most women don't do their self-breast examinations, it's going to be really incumbent upon you as the physician uh, to, uh, to, to know how to do uh, the physical examination of the breast. Uh, so I talked about that in the other section. Here we're going to talk about uh, breast cancer. So if you haven't uh, watched the other section, you should probably do that first. All right, so breast cancer is the second most common cancer in the U.S. Uh, next to skin cancer. Uh, and it's the second most deadly cancer among women, uh, second leading cancer killer among women, uh, and that's second to the lung, which is the leading cancer killer in both men and women. In 2013, uh, which is uh, last year, uh, 232,000 plus cases were reported in the U.S. 99% of them uh, were in women. Uh, so women outnumber men in breast cancer cases by about 150 to 1, but men can still get breast cancer. So it is also important to do a clinical breast examination on a male as well, especially certain males, which we'll talk about at the end. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in her life, so that's a lot. That means probably a woman in your family will be diagnosed with breast cancer at some point in her life. So uh, the risk increases as you get older. Um, it's virtually zero uh, below the age of 30, unless there's certain familial risk factors that are already there. Uh, but as you uh, get towards uh, 70, 80 years old, the risk is much higher. So this is something that increases with age. So some of those risk factors, of course, include being female, uh, old, being older, older than 40. 40 is when we start doing mammography in the general population. A personal history of breast cancer, of course, is going to increase your risk of developing breast cancer again in the future. A family history of breast cancer is also uh, a, a risk factor. Uh, these are things that are seen strongly in families, especially if they're primary relatives, so mother, sister, daughter. Null parity is a uh, risk factor for breast cancer, and null parity just means never having been pregnant. And uh, the reason that this is a risk factor is because it is thought that breast cancer uh, risk is higher if you're uh, exposed to uh, more estrogen. Uh, and so because when you're pregnant, your estrogen levels drop and your progesterone levels go up, uh, this reduces your lifetime exposure to estrogen. And so in sort of in that same line, obesity is also a risk factor for breast cancer. Remember that your, uh, your fat tissue stores estrogen. Hypertension and diabetes are also risk factors. Chronic stress, living in a cold climate is associated with breast cancer, and then white race or Jewish lineage. Um, sadly, uh, but interestingly, White women are more likely to get breast cancer than black women, but when black women get breast cancer, it's uh, more aggressive. So uh, that's something to, uh, to, to chew on. Uh, associations are going to be uh, basically all those things that increase your exposure to estrogen. So an early age at menarche, a later age at menopause, uh, both of which are tied to obesity. So if a, ch a child is heavier, she's more likely to uh, hit menarche at an early age. If she's uh, heavier, she's also likely to hit menopause as a, at a later age. Uh, so both of those are going to be tied to estrogen levels. Family history of gynecologic malignancies, especially uh, ovarian cancer. 
And then the use of contraceptives as a risk factor is debatable. Uh, there are some studies that have come out that have said no, that's most of them. Uh, some studies have come out that have said maybe, especially since there's so many different kinds of contraceptives, uh, oral contraceptives and the, uh, the, the uh, internal contraceptives that are placed in the cervix. Uh, it's really uh, hard to say. Um, more studies are coming out, uh, and so we'll have to uh, keep an eye on that. So that's debatable to know at this point. So the, uh, it's really important to keep in mind uh, when you're dealing with a specific woman uh, what her family history of breast cancer is. So uh, in primary relatives, if a woman has a, uh, a relative and this is primary relative, so meaning your mother, your sister, or your daughter, or for that matter, your father or your brother or your son, uh, but most of the time it's women. Uh, if they have a, uh, if it was premenopausal uh, and it was bilateral breast cancer on both sides, and usually when we see bilateral breast cancer, it's the uh, uh, lobular uh, carcinoma, but if it's bilateral and it happened before menopause, this specific woman is 8.8, .8, almost nine times more likely uh, to get breast cancer than the general population. If it's bi bilateral and postmenopausal, then it's only four times more likely, but that's still a significant amount. And remember that the older you get, the more likely in general you are to get breast cancer. Uh, so that's why with postmenopausal, it's a little bit less tied uh, to a higher likelihood. If it's only on one side, uh, if it's premenopausal, it's 1.8 times more likely, and if it's uh, only on one side postmenopausal, it's 1.2 times more likely. So bilateral breast cancer in a primary relative is a serious risk factor. There's also genetics. Women who have uh, extensive family histories, multiple sisters, or a mother and a sister, or a, a young sister, or a mother who got it at a young age, there are genetic testing that can be done, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the two that are done most commonly are the BRCA uh, mutation analyses. And so there's two BRCAs, BRCA1 and BRCA2. They're usually both tested. And so this testing is available for uh, women with extensive history of breast cancer, extensive family history. Also, the Lee Frau Many syndrome, which is a P53 mutation. Uh, remember this one, uh, back to when we talked about uh, cancer of, uh, of the bone, uh, this, is, uh, this is associated with uh, cancer of the breast, in addition, osteosarcomas, uh, neurologic tumors, and uh, adrenal carcinomas. All right, so when you're doing your physical exam, uh, and a lot of times breast cancer is uh, the, 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 the first inklings are during physical exam or routine physical exam. Uh, there's certain things you should look for. Now, obviously a breast mass, but remember that most breast masses are benign. Pretty much, I, I don't know, I think it's like 90%, 80, 80 to 90% of breast masses total are benign. So a breast mass alone is not enough to say, oh, I think you got breast cancer. There's other findings, especially that you got to know for your USMLE that you get in your patient vignette that make the breast mass more suspicious for a malignancy as opposed to a benign mass. So what do those include? Well, an ill-defined mass is something that is more consistent with uh, a malignancy than with a benign uh, uh, cancer, but that's there, there's, a, there's a big uh, spectrum between a well-defined mass and an ill-defined mass. So you can take that with a grain of salt. A fixed mass, now this is a big one because remember what is the most common breast mass? It is a fibroadenoma. And a fibroadenoma is classically a movable mobile mass. And a breast cancer is typically a fixed mass. Uh, it can be even more fixed if it's attached to the chest wall, which some breast cancers are, most aren't, but if it's attached to the chest wall, it's gonna be even more fixed in place. So that's something to document when you're, if you feel a breast mass. Is it movable or is it more fixed? Overlying skin changes are another thing that you definitely have to document because this is easy. You just have to look at the breast. And a lot of times uh, this is going to be a reason why a woman comes in 
uh, is because she sees that her breast has changed in its appearance. So orange peeling is the most obvious one. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very common uh, because it's more severe uh, and it's more associated with a rare type of cancer called inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, this is uh, very dire if you see orange peeling. This is very rarely going to be something that you see in uh, benign processes. So orange peeling, also called peau d'orange, it can be somewhat obvious when uh, you see it, although uh, there are more subtle cases. Dimpling is something you can see as well. Uh, this is probably because what's happening is the carcinoma is uh, getting larger and it's uh, uh, compromising the suspensory ligaments of Cooper. And that's what holds the breast sort of in its natural position. And so if that happens, then the skin is going to, uh, it's, parts of the skin are going to uh, get released and so you'll get what looks like a dimple. Uh, that's something a lot of times, again, that a woman is going to flat out notice when she looks at her breasts. Well, that wasn't there before. Erythema, and that's just due to the uh, local inflammation because of the tumor. Nipple retraction. Keep in mind, some women's nipples are retracted just normally, anatomically. Uh, so when we're talking nipple retraction, we're talking about a woman whose nipples were everted, but are now, it is, it's now retracted. And that's, again, going to be something a woman usually will pick up on before you do. And then finally, axillary lymphadenopathy. It's part of the self-breast examination is to look for axillary lymph nodes that might be, uh, that might be uh, bulky or inflamed. And so uh, that's something that can signify possibly uh, a malignancy, specifically a spread malignancy. Now, when you suspect breast cancer, and there's a caveat here, if it's in a woman older than 35, the very best first diagnostic step is mammography. The reason I put mammography here uh, is because most of the time when you have a patient who presents with the classic signs of breast cancer and she's suspicious for breast cancer, she's going to be over the age of 35. Not all women who have breast cancer though are over the age of 35. So if the woman is in her 20s, Mammography is not the best initial step. It's going to be sonography. And the reason is because mammography, even though it's the best test overall for breast cancer, it's not as good a test the younger a woman is. Uh, the older a woman gets, the better mammography is uh, at detecting breast cancer. The younger a woman is, the better sonography is. And that's just because of the density of the breast. When we're looking at mammography, it's kind of like an x-ray, and we're looking for a calcification. That calcification is hard to see when you have a dense breast that already kind of looks white on the, uh, on the mammogram to begin with. So sonogram is better for younger women. Generally, the cutoff line is under 35. Uh, older than 35, which is going to make up the vast majority of women with breast cancer, you're going to do the traditional mammography. Now, if you have uh, a lesion on mammogram or on sonogram, then, of course, you should biopsy it. If it's suspicious for a malignant lesion, then you should either do a surgical biopsy or a stereotactic core biopsy. Fine needle aspiration can be done as well, but usually fine needle aspiration is reserved for tumors uh, that we suspect to be benign. Even though fine needle aspiration can diagnose a malignancy, fine needle aspiration is better if you uh, are suspecting it's one of the benign lesions. Okay, so here's an example of dimpling. Um, can you see it? It's right there. So it's kind of hard to see at this angle. It kind of almost looks like a little bruise, but there's the dimpling right there. So these are things that you should be looking for on your physical examination of the breast. Now, obviously, the, the big sign would be a mass, but I can't show you a picture of a mass because you'd have to feel for that. So uh, here's more dimpling. Uh, you can see it right here. Maybe this perhaps is probably dimpling too, and you also see what might be, although I can't tell because it's only a two-dimensional picture, uh, nipple retraction, which is another sign. So a nipple retraction or nipple inversion uh, is another sign. Um, so uh, here's uh, another dimpling with nipple inversion. This is at a better angle to see it. And then this is normal breast. 
And here's breast erythema and what appears to be nipple inversion. Here's another sign. Uh, this is more associated with inflammatory breast cancer. So this is peau d'orange or uh, orange peeling. It's the French word. Uh, and you can see that uh, it looks a lot like uh, orange peel. So uh, some of those uh, some of those words that uh, the uh, histologists like to throw out don't look a lot like food, but this definitely looks like orange peel. So that might ruin oranges for you. But anyhow, here you can see this breast is definitely abnormal compared to this breast here. And here's another one. So definitely highlighting that texture. Okay, so we're going to look at two different types of uh, cancers of the breast, non-invasive and invasive, and that's certainly going to dictate how you treat the breast cancer. There are multiple variants of breast cancer, um, tissue variants, uh, but the, the two uh, types of breast cancer that you really need to keep in mind when you're first thinking about how we're going to treat the uh, woman is whether the breast cancer is invasive or not. And you're going to find that out on your biopsy. Uh, whether the cancer invades the basement membrane or not. Most of the time it does, but in some cases it doesn't. And of course in the cases it doesn't, that's going to be a better prognosis. But we still need to treat it. And the treatment is rather similar to the invasive breast cancers, but uh, there are some key differences. So we're going to look at the non-invasive breast cancers first. So just to look at a cartoon of the breast here, so this is kind of a... Uh, uh, cut of the breast. Here's the nipple, the areolar tissue, uh, and here's your lobules. These make milk, um, and then that connects to the ductules, which go to the ducts, and then the common duct, which then allows for the excretion of milk. So here we have two confined cancers, non uh, cancers that have not spread past the basement membrane, and they are lobular carcinoma in situ and ductal carcinoma in situ. Lobular, obviously, coming from the lobules, and uh, ductal coming from the ducts. And then, of course, infiltrate of stems past the basement membrane. Okay, so ductal carcinoma in situ is carcinoma, cancerous cells, that are confined to ductal tissue without invasion of the basement membrane. And so that'll be seen on biopsy. Of course, step two, step three, you don't need to worry about reading biopsies like you did for step one. So that's nice. Uh, so the, the treatment for this, and remember the symptoms of breast cancer, they're all the same. Okay, so whether it's, whether it's ducto or, uh, or lobular, uh, they're, they're all the same. Uh, with the, the inflammatory breast cancer, you're more likely to get that uh, orange peeling, but for the most part, the symptoms are all the same. So we're just going to talk about treatment here. So treatment for carcinoma in situ is going to be lumpectomy with or without radiation, and this is called breast conservation. Now most surgeons highly recommend radiation is done, and so I would err towards if you're getting just lumpectomy, you need to get radiation with that, uh, but that's not necessarily in stone. Uh, so lumpectomy with radiation is called breast conservation therapy. And breast conservation therapy is equal in efficacy, um, equal in survival to a modified radical mastectomy. Now, what is a modified radical mastectomy? A modified radical mastectomy is a removal of all the breast tissue, removal of the nipple areolar complex. So basically you're removing the entire boob and then you reconstruct uh, the breast after that, usually during the same surgery. Chemotherapy is not necessary for in situ carcinomas, but a lot of women get them even if it's in situ carcinoma. So this is at the call of the woman and the surgeon and an oncologist, but chemotherapy is not necessary for in situ carcinomas. Now, what's the difference between breast conservation and modified radical mastectomy? This is up to the surgeon, up to the woman, up to various recommendations, but ultimately it's, ultimately it's really up to the woman because the, the survival rates are equal. 
The difference is, of course, with just a lumpectomy uh, and radiation, you're going to have better cosmetic results. The breast is still going to be there. However, with lumpectomy, you have a 25% recurrence rate. So that's pretty high. One in four women are going to have uh, recurrence. And the problem is when that recurrence happens, a certain proportion of them, a significant proportion of them, are invasive carcinomas. And so that's, a, that's something that a woman may want to think about if she's younger. Well, down the road, she may get this cancer again, and it might come back worse. So uh, lumpectomy alone, you have about a 25% risk of, uh, of recurrence, and it may be invasive. If you get radiation with that lumpectomy, and this is probably the reason why uh, most surgeons recommend radiation with lumpectomy, that recurrence risk goes down to 8%. If you get a modified radical mastectomy, which the downside to that is the patient loses her breast, the recurrence risk is less than 1%. So that's the upside to getting the modified radical mastectomy. I should add, I believe in addition with the radical mastectomy, modified radical mastectomy, you're also removing the, uh, the nodes. Okay. Lobular carcinoma in situ. This is pretty much the same as ductal carcinoma, except that this comes from lobular tissue. Uh, but what's different uh, between lobular and ductal is that with lobular carcinoma in situ, one, it's more common to find it incidentally. Why? Because lobular carcinoma is more likely to calcify, and so it's more likely to be palpated as a mass. Uh, also, lobular carcinoma is a marker for increased risk of invasive cancer in uh, the other breast as well. So whereas with ductal carcinoma, uh, it's not so much tied to a risk of cancer in the other breast. With lobular carcinoma, say you have it in your right breast, you're at a very, very, very high risk of getting it in your left breast too. And so with lobular carcinoma, there's a much higher risk of bilaterality or a recurrence in the other breast. The treatment, again, same as uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, and of course is lobular carcinoma in situ, so not, no invasion of the basement membrane. Uh, treatment is the same, so lumpectomy with radiation or modified radical mastectomy. But in this case, if the woman is going to get a mastectomy, prophylactic bilateral mastectomy should be considered because you're removing one breast as, a pro as prophylaxis for the cancer coming back. You should really consider removing the other one too because lobular carcinoma is so likely to come back in the other breast too. So if you're going to remove one, it's good to remove both of them in lobular carcinoma because uh, you're not totally annihilating your risk uh, by just removing one. You still have a big risk in that other breast, much more so than ductal carcinoma. So lobular carcinoma, you definitely need to remember uh, the potential of getting, uh, I mean, there's always potential, but the, the high potential of getting uh, cancer in the other breast. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the invasive breast cancers. These are more common uh, just because these usually are larger and it takes uh, usually uh, the larger uh, tumors are the ones that are, uh, are, are diagnosed. Um, so I'm sure there's various reasons that go into that. Okay, so an infiltrating ductal carcinoma. Now we're talking about a ductal carcinoma in situ that has now invaded the basement membrane. Does that mean it's metastasized? No. But it has invaded the basement membrane, and there's a possibility that it has metastasized, either to the lymph node or to distant organs. This is the most common breast cancer, and it accounts for 70% of all breast cancer diagnoses. And part of the reason for this is infiltrating ductal carcinoma is a very broad category of histological breast cancers. So your initial workup for an a ductal carcinoma or a lobular carcinoma, any breast cancer that we know has infiltrated, it's not in situ. Your initial workup is going to include, in addition to the biopsy, which you need that to know that it's infiltrated, you're going to get a chest x-ray to look for lung metastases. 
You're going to get a CT of the liver to look for liver metastases. You're going to get liver function tests to look for liver metastases that may not be apparent on a CT. And then you're also going to get a bone scan. So this is going to be part of your initial workup before you go forth with any uh, before you go forth with any treatment. And the reason is because what kind of treatment we do is going to depend on whether or not the cancer is metastasized or moved to lymph nodes, etc. Okay, so the treatment uh, for infiltrating ductal carcinoma. First off, you're going to do surgery. You pretty much do surgery in every uh, breast cancer patient with the exception of the inflammatory breast cancer, uh, which we'll talk about at the end, some of these exceptions. Uh, but you're going to do surgery with ductal carcinoma. The surgery includes lumpectomy and sentinel node biopsy. And uh, so why do we do a sentinel node biopsy or this node biopsy? Well, when we had these carcinomas in situ, we knew that they weren't invading the basement membrane. So if they weren't invading the basement membrane, they can't get anywhere else. The basement membrane is what holds it together. The basement membrane here has been invaded, and so now we need to see if there is a, uh, a invasion of the lymph nodes. So what's done here is while the lumpectomy procedure is being done, a dye is, uh, is introduced, either a, a, an actual physical dye or a nuclear colloid dye, and then the, uh, the first node will light up, and that's your sentinel node, your first node. And what's done is that node is then taken straight over to surgical pathology, literally taken right over. Um, I've actually personally carried a lymph node from an OR to a pathologist. Um, that node is taken over to be biopsied, and uh, it's biopsied on the spot. If there are, uh, if, if there are, if there's invasion of the node, then you're going to take out all the axillary lymph nodes. If there's no invasion of the sentinel node, you don't need to do that. Okay, so lumpectomy plus sentinel node biopsy, and then radiation will be done after that as well. Modified radical mastectomy, that includes all of your axillary lymph node uh, harvesting. So you're already taking out all the axillary lymph nodes, so there's no need to do sentinel node biopsy. However, you can do a, the mastectomy procedure and do a sentinel node biopsy uh, if you want to try to preserve the axillary lymph nodes. So the treatment is really... Uh, kind of variable here. Uh, or you can do a radical mastectomy if there's invasion of the pectoralis major muscle. So the, the modified radical mastectomy is just a radical mastectomy minus the, the pec major uh, dissection. So those are our surgical procedures to choose from. Chemotherapy, we're not going to talk about here because this is a surgical lecture, but uh, it's uh, CAF or CMF therapy, uh, it's cyclophosphamide, adriamycin and 5-fluorouracil, or in the case of M, it's methotrexate. Hormone therapy is also done uh, in cases where there's uh, spreading, so uh, chemotherapy and hormone therapy are both done for spreading. Hormone therapy would be done if the tumor is uh, estrogen or progesterone receptor positive. Now, uh, this will be found out on the original biopsy of the cancer. So if the tumor is estrogen or progesterone receptor positive, then you'll be adding on these hormonal therapy uh, medications. Uh, these include estrogen inhibitors, such as tamoxifen or raloxifene, or uh, anastrozole, which I believe is uh, a, an aromatase inhibitor, blocks the conversion to estrogen. So the infiltrating lobular carcinoma, this is pretty much the same song and dance as the infiltrating ductal carcinoma, uh, just a different cell type. You're going to do the same workup, chest x-ray, CT of the liver, liver function tests, bone scan. Big difference though here is that there is a strong tendency towards bilaterality. So if you're going to do a mastectomy, you should consider removing the other breast while you're at it. It's a consideration for the woman. It's not necessary, but it's something that she may want to do, uh, or maybe she doesn't. So it's up to her. Uh, you're going to do the same, uh, the same surgeries, uh, so lumpectomy and sentinel biopsy with radiation. 
uh, modified radical mastectomy if you choose to go that route. Um, you can also include sentinel node biopsy there if you want to try to conserve your axillary lymph nodes. Radical mastectomy, uh, mastectomy can be done if there's invasion of pec major. And then chemotherapy and radiation. Chemo is done if there's uh, spread to nodes or elsewhere. Hormone therapy done if it's estrogen or progesterone receptor positive. Uh, now, again, I'm going to add here that chemotherapy is not necessary if there is no spread to nodes uh, or anywhere else. If it's confined to the breast, you don't need to do chemotherapy. Even if it's infiltrated, if it's gone into the basement membrane, but it hasn't gone to the nodes, you don't have to do chemotherapy. But a lot of women do because it reduces the risk of recurrence. So, uh, re but remember, there are downsides to chemotherapy. Remember that pretty much all chemotherapeutic drugs call, cause myelosuppression, and they increase your risk of developing uh, a leukemia. So, uh, there's downsides to chemotherapy. Again, this is tailored to the, the desires of the woman as well as the recommendations. So, we'll go over some additional treatment strategies, kind of rehash a little bit of what we already talked about. So. When you have ductal or lobular breast cancer, if it's localized, in other words, if it's, uh, if it's in situ or if it hasn't moved off to, if it's infiltrated but it hasn't moved off to a, uh, a node, uh, then in that case you're going to do uh, either a modified radical mastectomy uh, or a lumpectomy with sentinel node biopsy and radiation. Again, you can include radiation in all of this. You can include sentinel node biopsy in all this. You can include chemotherapy in all this. This is just the minimum here. Okay. If it's systemic, meaning that it has metastasized uh, beyond uh, uh, the, the breast to a lymph node, uh, then you're going to, uh, in addition to surgery, I should have probably added that here, surgery in most cases, uh, in addition to removing the tumor, uh, you're also going to do chemotherapy and radiation uh, and hormonal therapy in the cases where uh, the tumor is estrogen or progesterone positive. There's also adjunctive therapy that can be done. There is a uh, slice of cancers, of breast cancers, that are positive for an oncogene called HER2 nu. And HER2 nu positive uh, cancers are a little bit more aggressive, and that used to carry a negative prognosis, but in the last 15 years, uh, we came out with a drug called trastuzumab, or Herceptin, and it blocks the HER2 new receptor uh, gene, whatever it causes, and actually will uh, lead to a better prognosis in cancers that are positive for this gene, now that we're able to uh, tailor fit our therapy towards that specific gene. So when you're doing the biopsy, when you're doing all those initial diagnoses and defining the cancer initially, when you make your initial diagnosis before you do any kind of treatment, apart from looking for estrogen and progesterone receptors, you are also looking for uh, the HER2 new oncogene because you can use this medication. So remember, uh, surgical treatment pretty much always done with the exception of uh, of uh, inflammatory cancer. Uh, this is always going to include at least an axillary lymph node biopsy, at least your sentinel node biopsy. With breast conservation, what you're doing here is you're removing the tumor with histologically clear margins, then you're doing your sentinel node biopsy. You're going to remove the rest of your axillary lymph nodes if you have a positive biopsy. If it's negative, you don't need to do uh, removal. Modified radical mastectomy is another route you can go. In this case, you're going to remove the breast tissue along with the nipple areolar complex. You'll also dissect uh, the axillary lymph nodes and biopsy them, but you could also do a sentinel node biopsy and leave the lymph nodes potentially if it's negative. Uh, also, this is going to include breast reconstruction. Radiation is recommended for patients undergoing, especially undergoing breast conservation, just because you leave yourself at a little bit higher of a uh, recurrence rate. Uh, but it's also recommended in patients who are at high risk. And high risk means if you have a positive uh, axillary lymph node invasion um, or if you have other risk factors that you don't need to know for uh, your test uh, that puts you at risk for uh, developing breast cancer again. Specifically, being young would be something that you'd want to think about.
Breast conservation and uh, modified radical mastectomy, can't emphasize enough, have equal survival outcomes, so this is really at the uh, decision of the patient, but modified radical mastectomy has a lower likelihood of recurrence. So a woman may just think, well, I just want to be done with this. I don't care. I don't want to get breast cancer again. I want to be done. I don't care about having breasts. Just take them off. That's her choice. It has a lower likelihood of recurrence, but of course you're always going to run into patients who they don't want to do that, and that's okay too. We have breast conservation for that. Chemotherapy is generally indicated for patients who have a positive lymph node status, and it's always indicated in patients uh, who have metastasis, uh, distal metastasis. And uh, I do want to add, uh, if you have uh, a positive uh, internal mammary lymph nodes, that's considered a distant, distant metastasis, not just a lymph node metastasis. Uh, the regimens here are going to include uh, CAF and CMF. Chemotherapy, though, can also be done in patients who don't have positive lymph node status. So that's not unheard of. Hormonal therapy is indicated for patients that are positive for estrogen and progesterone receptors, but not for patients who don't have positive estrogen and progesterone receptors. And it's uh, in postmenopausal patients who have positive estrogen and progesterone receptors, actually hormonal therapy alone is equal to chemotherapy in efficacy. So Though you may want to do chemotherapy in those patients for various reasons, it's up to the oncologist, um, in older patients, doing hormonal therapy alone has shown to be equal in efficacy. So in very old patients, like let's say 70s or 80s, who might not do really well on chemotherapy just because it's so intense, hormonal therapy alone uh, can be a, a good treatment plan for that. And as I mentioned, the HER2 new oncogene, very important that you look for that because if it is positive, it's associated with a uh, more aggressive cancer, but we have an answer for that now. We can put them on Herceptin, trastuzumab, uh, and that leads to much better results. And then, of course, intensive follow-up is with any patient who has cancer. Uh, so now we'll just go over some rare breast cancers and some special considerations. So some rare types of breast cancer, you've heard me refer to inflammatory breast cancer multiple times. This is an aggressive breast cancer variant. The symptoms include that orange peeling, dimpling, metastasis. Uh, surgery is generally contraindicated for inflammatory breast cancer. So uh, with, with inflammatory breast cancer, generally we're just going to do chemotherapy and the prognosis uh, here is poor. I believe for uh, chemotherapy, though, now they're using doxorubicin. Uh, in, I don't know if it's an addition or in replacement for CAF or CMF, um, and that's actually show better results. Um, but I don't know if that, I don't think that's gonna be on your test. Okay, infiltrating papillary carcinoma is another somewhat rare variant. Um, the reason I bring this up is because if you remember uh, the intraductal papilloma, has a similar name and they can have a similar presentation. So you have to include in a patient who has bloody nipple discharge, even though the number one cause is an intraductal papilloma, you have to include infiltrating papillary carcinoma on your differential and so this is why we always biopsy it. Paget's disease of the breast is a common way for patients to present with breast cancer. So the chief symptom of Paget's disease of the breast, which you could also include Paget's disease of the breast as a symptom, because it can be a symptom of breast cancer. The chief symptom of Paget's disease of the breast is eczematous dermatitis of the nipple. And so you can have nipple bleeding in this case too, but it's not really nipple discharge bleeding. It's actually bleeding of the skin on the nipple. Uh, and so... Uh, the thing with Paget's disease of the breast, if you have this eczematous dermatitis of the nipple, it almost always signals an underlying breast cancer, 94% of the time. And so it's not so much important that you're diagnosing eczematous dermatitis over the nipple. It's important that the minute you see eczematous dermatitis over the nipple, you're sending that patient straight over to get mammography. And that's going to be your best initial diagnostic step. 94% of the time, you're going to find some kind of mass. You'll work up that mass as usual, and the treatment will progress um, just like any other breast cancer.
Some final notes, uh, male breast cancer is possible, although it's highly outnumbered by females. A lot of men don't know that they can get breast cancer, so any time that you have, uh, you should always be part of your comprehensive physical examination, even of a male, is going to include a breast examination, palpating for the breast. Um, treatment, though, here is going to be uh, the same uh, as female breast cancer, but the problem with male breast cancer is because so many males don't realize that hey, a lump in my breast can mean breast cancer too, they don't come in until it's very, very late. And so usually they don't uh, present until they're at a much uh, later stage. The men who are at risk for male breast cancer uh, definitely are going to include the men with Klinefelter syndrome. So remember that's your uh, XXY. Uh, and then men who are at higher estrogen levels. So who do we think of when we think of higher estrogen levels in men? We think of men with liver disease because remember what your liver does, it gets rid of estrogen. So men with liver disease usually have higher estrogen levels. They're at increased risk as well, but this is incredibly rare. Breast cancer during pregnancy is going to be worked up the same way. So you have a woman who's got a uh, pregnancy and she's got symptoms of breast cancer, um, I mean, sure, you can do a biopsy. What, if, what happens if she has cancer? What do we do different? There's really not much we do different in treatment. We don't do radiation at all during the pregnancy. If we're going to do that, we wait until after the pregnancy. And then chemotherapy, if she's in her first trimester, we don't give her the chemotherapy during the first trimester. We wait until she's in her second or third trimester. Then you can actually do chemotherapy. It's fine. What you don't need to do is abort the pregnancy. There's no need to do that for breast cancer during pregnancy. You can go ahead with all of the treatment just as you normally would with breast cancer, just with these two minor exceptions, and there's no difference in survival. Uh, Preoperative radiation and chemotherapy is often performed in patients with very large breast cancers. So normally the way we think about it is, well, we do surgery and then we do radiation and chemo. And that's usually what we do. But in women with very, very, very large breast cancers, um, it's usually not possible to do surgery on such a large tumor. And so uh, we'll usually start with radiation and chemo before going into the OR. Uh, to uh, do whatever uh, surgery is going to be done. And that's just to try to shrink the cancer. Um, so I don't expect you're going to see that on the USMLE, but I just figured I'd add it in for uh, uh, just for uh, completion's sake. But definitely remember with breast cancer during pregnancy, um, just these two exceptions, don't give radiation during pregnancy ever, uh, and chemotherapy only in the second and third trimester can you give it. Um, that is probably going to come up on the test. And if you have any questions, definitely let me know. This is a big, big, big changing area of uh, medicine. Lots and lots of research going into breast cancer. Uh, so I'm sure within a few years, this uh, lecture may uh, be showing some signs of being outdated. Uh, so uh, let me know if you have any questions.